is overview. I do make a lot of forward looking statements. So please um, take note of that. So what is Mundoro? And, and thanks for that segue, uh, Joe, because I think it is important to really understand the different types of uh, business models in our business. Uh, some companies focus on resource expansion and development and others uh, like ourselves really focus on that early stage exploration in order to create a new discovery for our business. But that can be a very difficult and costly uh, investment. And certainly the capital markets over the last 10 years has not had as much of an appetite for this um, type of model. Having said that, partners do. And that is certainly what we're focused on. We're, we're focused on partnering with the major miners that need uh, more copper resources and are prepared to uh, obviously make those capital commitments right from the very beginning when you're targeting and you're testing those targets. So what we're focused on is Eastern Europe, which is the Western portion of the Tethian belt. Uh, all of our assets are around what we call strategic locations, meaning around existing mining hubs. There is infrastructure, there is rail, there is power, uh, there is uh, human resources, uh, great knowledge of the business, and as well, great communities that support uh, a lot of the development that goes on. And we are uh, very much focused on copper and gold and don't really look at the lead zinc systems in the region. So, just a really high level overview of, of, the, of the model. So our expertise is knowing a district, knowing what's in that district, uh, recognizing where the opportunities are, having the team uh, that's been on the ground, recognizing how to operate in terms of getting the licenses granted, um, also how to make sure that the licenses stay in good standing, exploring, doing all the logistics, and that's the value that we bring to the partners. Um, second, we partner these types of assets with certain size companies. Uh, all of it is 100% sole funded by them. We also are prepared to go into strategic alliances, and we've done that with one of our partners, Jogmik in Bulgaria. So we've expanded out of Serbia into Bulgaria. Tremendously interesting opportunities in this region. The Soviets, one thing they were amazing at was uh, cataloging deposits and never actually mining them. So uh, I think uh, a lot of our shareholders and certainly investors are going to see some interesting things come out of that generative alliance going forward. Um, we definitely look at joint ventures, earnings, options. We monetize every single asset we have. We do that primarily through maintaining an NSR royalty. Uh, we collect operator fees for managing those assets in the beginning. Uh, nobody, no, no matter how big you are, <laughs> knows how to operate in every jurisdiction. So you need a local partner, and we are that local partner for our uh, mining companies in that first phase. And then in the second phase, we do definitely want to hand over the keys. And at that point, we start collecting advanced royalty payments. Uh, we in certain cases can be carried to commercial production. And we also do outright sale of our assets. And we've done that uh, with a couple of our assets in our portfolio and other jurisdictions. So what does that look like? Um, you know, one of the things that we, you don't normally see this from a lot of exploration companies, but this is um, at the end of the day, what creates a discovery and creates value in a company is dollars going in the ground. And you have got to have the ability to sustain that. That's fundamental. Your biggest uh, hurdle in that process is dilution. So how can I maintain dilution while I maximize the value going in the ground in order to create that discovery or create that bigger value in the project that you're exploring? So this gives you a sense of how this model has been working over the last six years. Uh, we've been growing the expenditures in the ground, which is, gives our shareholders a lot more opportunity for that discovery. At the same time, those payments that we get paid offset our uh, corporate expenses, and that is what maintains dilution. So I think um, it's a really interesting way of evaluating uh, expiration companies. I used to be in equity research, so <laughs> I did this a lot. Um, I also like to separate out who does what. I think it's really important when, especially the retail uh, side of the business, starts looking at expiration companies and trying to compare who does what. You hear a lot of technical jargon. At the end of the day, recognizing that, look, you're in there in order to make a return on your investment. And there are different ways to make a return on an investment. Make sure you understand the model that you're getting into. Does the management team have the experience to execute on that model and what value do they bring? 
and certainly the portfolio. I mean, uh, without a fantastic asset, uh, no matter who the management team is, it's hard to move that forward. So there's three categories here that, that we kind of uh, cross over. There's the generators, uh, there's the royalty companies, and then there's the explorers. And what we generally find is that target testing companies tend to range between, let's call it five to 20 to 30 million market cap. Uh, and then you remove the cash and you have an enterprise value. And then every, everything else above that is really uh, what we call resource expansion. So Mandoro being solely focused on the discovery phase, we are looking at um, basically transitioning our portfolio into that royalty phase. Uh, all of our assets are here in Eastern Europe. Uh, this, the, the physical presence of this one belt, one road, uh, uh, let's call it strategy of China is creating a very interesting relationship. It's creating a lot of investment in the region. And for that reason, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more activity. Certainly the M&A activity in this region has picked up heavily over the last five years. And that's no surprise. Um, you know, what we saw back in the 1980s and the 90s in Chile and Peru and basically all along the uh, Western Cordelia and, and uh, or North and South America along the West Coast is what you see here. Uh, people are going to start vying for these assets. Uh, and I think that's going to be, you know, another new opportunity for the region. Um, but circling in on where the assets are, we're, we're I'd say about 60-40 weighted in, in terms of Serbia, Bulgaria. Bulgaria is already in the European Union. Serbia is a candidate to become in the European Union. Certainly everybody knows Serbia for the fact that uh, there is about 4 billion tons of porphyry in Timok. And when you have that kind of tonnage, you recognize that there's something going on in that, in that region, something uh, in that Timok uh, magmatic complex has created a very interesting um, series of porphyry structures and having proximity uh, to that main feeder structure is one of the critical parts of, of the land package process, which is what we achieved uh, by being here first. I like to show this slide because people who don't necessarily go out to this part of the world might not know what it's like, but you know, think like circa 1980 Sudbury. Uh, there is a, a, a healthy mining um, community here. Everyone who lives in this town either works at the mine or around services to the mine. And this is what I talk about infrastructure. You know, when we talk about in the industry, what's, what's an economic deposit? You know, what cutoff does it need to be? Uh, where is it located? You know, if you're thinking about a billion dollars for uh, development of more, most porphyries, how much are you spending actually getting your services to site, which can be, you know, a quarter to a third of your uh, capex. That's all paid for you in this district. So a lot of the grade that you see here um, is a reflection of the fact that you're leveraging 100 years of investment. And even the Export Development Bank of Canada has invested in the smelter here, which is interesting. So our land package is the gold, blue, and and red colored areas. I'm not going to go into details about the specific projects. 10 minutes is <laughs> absolutely not enough time, Joe. But having said that, I will just give you an overview picture and we're always happy to talk about the assets in detail uh, and get our geos online so that uh, people can really understand the geochemistry, the alteration, the targeting, the geophysics, uh, the structural analysis, which is a really big part of obviously what we do every day. Uh, this is the Jog McMandoro project. Uh, a lot of drilling has gone into here, but a lot of that has gone through cover. Um, and, and here's what's really interesting about this particular um, uh, kind of region. So this is the Bohr mine. This is kind of the flagship. Uh, from there, you've got the Veliki Crivelli porphyry deposit. Down to the south, you've got the Chukato Pecky discovery, which is now a development project. And here to the, to the west, uh, this is all our project area with Jog Mech. And to the east, this is all our project area with ballet. So what is interesting, and you know what you heard me say a little bit earlier, is that its proximity to these systems is important. Uh, and it is because the way that the structures uh, really control where those, those um, uh, porphyries will basically occur. And I'm just going to show you, I hope this works. Uh, this is a 3D video of what that looks like. Uh, these holes are really far apart. Uh, some of them are about five, five kilometers apart. Um, they're basically testing these geophysical targets. We've identified this alteration system, uh, which is really the beginning of a lot of these porphyries. And you can see in the background uh, that was the Chukato Pecky porphyry in terms of size and scale. Uh, we really need to drill deeper, and that is the next phase of our exploration at this asset. 
Um, I don't have in here the porphyry for, for bore, but basically it would be right around here and it comes down a similar size. So a lot of what you're going to hear about from the Borsco project is about deeper drilling. Uh, looking, we've got potassic alteration at the bottom here, which is identifying, you know, drilling at depth. We've got a really interesting reinterpretation of the geophysics this year, which has um, basically been able to utilize the data a lot more effectively and really kind of home in exactly where we want to be drilling. Um, can't have a picture of Eastern Europe without a lattice. So there it is. That's how our cream, our, our uh, team gets around. Um, so just to kind of summarize with Valet, they just became involved with us last year. They're in these golden colored licenses. Uh, the joint venture is being set up and essentially we want to be out in the field uh, drilling this year. Definitely the first quarter was affected. Uh, there was a state of emergency in the country. We weren't allowed to operate uh, after there was basically a curfew at 3 p.m. So you're, it's not an effective way to use your field time. Um, so we're hoping in the second half of the year we can get out there and start testing these targets. Now what we have available for optioning, this is new information uh, that we just reported on yesterday. So Freeport was with us in these two project areas. They were part of the discovery team of Chicago Pecky. Um, but unfortunately, due to kind of uh, circumstances out of their control, and obviously Joe did a great presentation on the crunch on certain copper producers, uh, they've had to divest from uh, certain portions of their uh, global exploration portfolio. And as a result, we've got these projects back 100%. And that's, uh, I think, uh, a really interesting opportunity. Uh, we have opened the data room. We have received interest. As soon as I put out the press release, we've already gotten inbound emails. So I think that this project area speaks to the potential of the region. When you've got eight kilometers of an alteration system right on surface here, uh, you've got another eight kilometers down here, uh, another eight kilometers that we haven't even started looking at here on the east side of this license area. It's, it's the kind and scale of system that the majors need in order to find the footprints of what they're looking for, for these uh, system, for basically deposits that the, they would uh, consider operating in the future. Um, I think this is an area that we can continue to bring in partners and so keep Keep your eyes open for that uh, in the second half of the year. Why does it look interesting? Again, I have another video here, which I really hope um, the audience can see. But this gives you a sense of um, the target testing process. You start with what you know, which is geochemistry and alteration on surface. And then you start building out that 3D picture, right? Where, what does it look like? What is the geophysics telling us? You test the target. You understand what's going in, on in geochemistry and in alteration downhole and then you step out from there based on your exploration model. It is a, uh, a very iterative process, uh, but as you carry on and you build on that data set of, of, um, of basically the geochemistry and the alteration, you get closer to the zones and you really start to understand what is controlling mineralization and ideally for the purpose of making a discovery. Um, here at the north end of uh, Timic, we picked up this project area. Again, this was, package was picked up in uh, 2011. Uh, this was just north of the Minampec mine. It is the operating profitable mine of uh, Zijing, which now owns two thirds of, of the bore assets and uh, one third owned by the government. This um, basically mineralized system that we found uh, just one and a half kilometers north of Minampec uh, is really interesting. It shows a very nice, uh, you know, kind of traditional um, kind of zonation of a porphyry system in the west zone. Uh, the east zone is very interesting. It looks like a muted geochem anomaly, but when you look at it, it actually has higher grade uh, intercepts. Uh, this shows you the chargeability anomaly that we've been playing around with. Uh, this is an evolving model and something that definitely needs to look, be looked at again. But this, this gives you a sense that, um, you know, there is a lot of potential in the region. And really what it comes down to is capital getting invested to drill out where the resources are. So uh, that's why you need partners uh, in this particular market. This is, a, this is a really interesting area. So this is Panagorshta as you travel along the southeast uh, in the region and you stay along that upper Cretaceous portion of the belt. Uh, you get into what we call the Timic of Bulgaria. Uh, this also has a few porphyry mines, a high sulfidation system here, which is Cello Pech. Uh, which is kind of, we equate it to the upper zone of, of Chicago Pecky. And here, this is a project area that came uh, to public tender a couple of years ago. We won that tender and had historically mined 6 million tons of a percent copper and three grams per ton gold, which is coincidentally what uh, the current reserve is of, 
of cello pitch. We think this is a fundamentally important opportunity, uh, obviously for our shareholders, but also to show in the region what's the potential. So the Soviets do, like I said, a fantastic job of categorizing assets. Uh, this was, um, this was a, obviously a government run mine. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is we've digitized all the data we could buy. Here's the shaft. It's gone across at the uh, 500, 600, and 700 foot levels. Uh, you can see that anything below 700 feet is essentially uh, the resource that's left behind. Everything above has been mined out. The green um, uh, or certain kind of intercepts here, the, the yellow is 0.5% copper. Uh, and certainly you can see in some parts here that there is actually close to 1% copper available on surface. This intercept here is about 12 meters of about 5% copper. So it, is, it just gives you an example that uh, with some good knowledge of the district, understanding where the systems are, recognizing uh, how to compete locally, it's really um, a good opportunity for companies to make some fantastic uh, discoveries. And obviously this wouldn't be a, a discovery in the sense that you are taking an old resource and developing it further. Uh, we spend a lot of time on on uh, basically managing our communication with communities. That's an extremely important part of what we do because all of our programs are partnered with the majors. We have very, very good, uh, what I would call governance, environmental and social standards. Uh, and I think that's a fundamental part of our business. You know, it's, it's a shame that we're just starting to talk about it now as an industry, but I think everyone on this panel will agree that that's the fundamental part of what you do every day. You're out in those communities, you're talking to people, and you're developing relationships and trust. Um, this gives you a sense of who the team is. The team has been built around these assets. So it's not that we had a team and we started going out and looking for projects. We knew where we wanted to be and we brought in the expertise essentially to, to manage these uh, exploration programs. And finally, to leave uh, in terms of a high level review of the company, um, our share structure is pretty tight. We've been around since, uh, if you can believe it, uh, 19, uh, 2003 and as a company since 1999. Uh, we have been trading at that, let's call it 10 million market cap. Um, I think that the market and certainly with copper prices, uh, the long-term fundamentals for copper are fantastic. Uh, Short-term, there's definitely a squeeze in the market, but uh, long-term, this commodity has, it is the commodity that every major base metal company is looking for. Uh, and I think as a sector, there's a lot less companies available uh, that are exploring for copper and focused on it. But uh, I think you're going to hear a lot of really interesting news coming out of Eastern Europe and specifically on these on these assets. So I think we're extremely uh, good share structure. Um, we've got a shareholder base uh, in the U.S. between Sprott, Adrian Day, uh, Don Smith. In Europe, we've got Roofer and Gold 2000. Uh, in Canada, we've got a family trust office that's been an investor since 2012. Uh, we've got Altius Minerals as a streaming company that's an investor. And certainly uh, with 3 million cash, we can certainly take this uh, much further. So uh, I'm always happy to answer questions. And that is the end of my presentation, Joe.